So I do want to say, if anyone has questions about meetups, um, the Houston Data Visualization or Girls Coding Club meetups, which is, the Girls Coding Club is not for necessarily teenage girls or younger girls, but it is a women's coding meetup. Um, feel free to ask me afterwards. But today I'm here to talk about practical considerations for data science consulting and innovation in a large organization. And I want to motivate this by saying why practical considerations? Um, essentially, my colleague and I conceptualized of this talk as everything they don't teach you in school about data science. <laughs> right? So we've been talking a lot about algorithms or methods or technologies. Right? This is all the stuff that you can't figure out just by necessarily figuring out like what vendor has the best product for you, what's the best machine learning algorithm for your data. This is kind of all of the other stuff. And I will say that this knowledge is very hard earned on the part of me and my colleague. And so this might be a good time then to introduce me and um, my colleague who will be joining us via pre-recorded video. All right, we work on an internal data science consulting firm. Um, if you'll notice on the first slide, it says Validor. That's who we technically work for. But we support NASA's Office of the Chief Information Officer doing a lot of internal data science and consulting things. Um, and so we're going to talk about some of these practical considerations and how they can impact the effectiveness of a team um, of data scientists within an organization. And this is the lens that we're going to come at from this is that we are practitioners, right? So we're saying we're practitioners who happen to have a really unique organization-wide view because of where we sit in the organization. We're not talking from the perspective of a startup, right? Some Companies are small, they're software focused, they're focused on developing a code related product, and they're relatively young, and that's not what we're saying. We want to say instead that we're talking about a large established organization, right? an organization that's been around since before data science was a buzzword, because there was a time before that. Um, <laughs> and there were technologies and processes and culture built before all of um, this data science stuff came about, even though people have been doing things like that. And an organization whose core function isn't necessarily building software or technical products. Right? It can be a technical organization in the sense that it's like engineering or science focused, but, but again, something whose core function is not software. And this talk is built um, not just from the perspective of our experience at NASA, but developed also in conjunction with conversations we've had with our colleagues in other industries as well. And so before I talk about you know, how to do data science or some of these practical considerations, I want to define data science as this really grab bag of things. Machine learning, deep learning, statistics, data visualization, saying that kind of all of these will fall under the umbrella of data science for the purposes of this talk. Here's a quick roadmap of the talk. Right? We want to talk first about data access because it's the lowest level at which you can go. You can't really do any kind of data science or analytics if you don't have data to begin with. Um, and then the next thing we'll talk about right, is the value out of data science and, um, and also the influence of procurement constraints. Right? Large organizations often come with processes and paperwork. Um, and that's no different for the process of procurement, for buying things. Um, and so we want to talk a little bit about that. We want to talk about the ways we communicate about data science, about our results. And finally, zooming out all the way out to the org structure level, what are different models for how to implement data science in a large organization? So my colleague is actually going to begin this next section. Hi, my name is Justin Gassis. I'm Hi, my name is Justin Gassis. I'm sorry I couldn't make it in person, but I've recorded these slides beforehand. I'm going to be talking about data access in this section of the talk. It's common in data science talks and blog posts for someone to say that data science is 80% data cleaning and 20% modern analytics, etc. While that can sometimes be true, um, it assumes that you, you have the data to start with. For data science teams acting as internal consultancies in a large organization, Obtaining access to actionable data can be a substantial task in and of itself. Often the data owners are not you, they're not your team, uh, and they may, may not be the customers or clients you're actually working with either. So getting good data is a common pain point. 
Um, in this section, I'm talking about a few data access topics, including creating data that does not exist or you don't have access to yet, whether it is programmatically accessible, data cleaning concerns, data compliance, data's political power, and finally, having a good local partner on any data project. Does the data exist yet is not always a straightforward question. Sometimes the data exists, but it would take too long to get it, or sometimes it exists, but it doesn't have all the attributes you need. The data doesn't exist yet, and you're going to collect real data. Congratulations, you're now into data engineering. Uh, this involves data collection, reliability, engineering, databases, etc. Um, these often have a tendency to slowly grow in scope over time as expectations rise. Um, as the project moves forward and other things are added on. Um, so even for a toy prototype projects, um, this is an area to be careful of scope creep. Another option is to say, oh, I'll just create some fake data. Um, for, for, there are a variety of helpful libraries for creating fake data, and if you really need to get something out the door quick or to show an example of what something could be, um, that could be a good option. Um, but in my experience, a product built on fake data almost always has to be re rebuilt, and you probably underestimate how much has to be rebuilt when you start. Um, so that very likely or probable additional work should be built into your schedule. Going on to the next slide. Getting the data out of legacy systems and into a form you can work with is another very common hurdle in working in a large organization. This is because large organizations tend to be organizations that have been around for a while. Uh, this means most of their systems were made before data science were a thing, and most of their systems before APIs and microservices were a common thing to discuss. Basically, you might be dealing with something designed for human entry and retrieval, possibly one file at a time, not programmatic access. This, this is a problem if you need to have thousands of files to do any sort of work. Often if you're working on a small study or prototype, or you can start that way, you, you may be able to start off by scraping some of the data. By scraping, I mean accessing the system by logging in as a human, and then using a combination of things like Selenium and Beautiful Soup libraries to write a program that then pretends to be a human and then kind of automates that process designed for humans um, to at least get some of the data out and then you use that data subset to develop a small demo. Then you go to the data owners and say, hey, look, we can make something really cool for you. We can make something really useful for you. You should give us better data access. Data cleaning is another issue. Often you need a subject matter expert to not just help clean the data so much as translate all of its warts and weird features that have developed over a significant amount of time as people and systems have changed. Getting a subject matter expert with enough time to help you is another area where you can really make or break a project. If you get all the way to the presentation stage and there is some non-intuitive part of the data that a subject matter expert that they all know, but you don't. Um, it can make the audience skeptical of your entire project. Um, worse yet, if you don't have access to a subject matter expert um, during the project work, who is responding quickly to you, um, you can have questions and then get in a holding pattern, and so you're, um, um, you end up in the email question answer purgatory, where work gets stalled while you wait for answers. So understanding how much help we will need is critical when setting up a new project. If you don't have the right organizational support, um, a project can get slow to a crawl and potentially even never finish. Even in public facing universities or government positions where you expect a lot of data to be public, there can still be a lot of data that needs to be kept secure. Financial data, people data, data not yet finalized, all have security protocols. Who approves that you're doing it correctly? Who set up the rules? Uh, did they have you or your use case in mind? Can approval processes actually get done on your time frame? Is there a well-established approval process? These are all things I find out as early as possible as they can push back your timeline for the project or even make your project not possible. 
Also, forgiveness rather than permission, it doesn't work so well here. So don't try it. Next slide. Why well, wasn't it necessary to go to Machiavellian here? It's important to remember that data has human owners, producers, cleaners, users. This means that at some level, data is power. When you try to do a new thing with data, especially data that already exists in some sort of legacy system, you may be disrupting an already well-balanced system. If you experience pushback, being able to step back and understand another person's perspective can sometimes be uh, a useful skill to develop. It is critically important for our data science consulting groups to have good partners whose interests and resources align with their goals. An ideal partner will already have data access permissions, knowledge of the data reality, and is better equipped to fight organizational battles around the data, as they often know the players, turf, and the priors of the context that our project is operating within. A good partner will also have the time and resources to contribute to the project at a level necessary for its success and is capable of carrying on ownership of the project into the future. As data science is a new field, there's a lots of hype, lots of new teams, lots of real but ambiguous possibilities, and low management familiarity with how to apply this skill set. This all means that the potential for a mismatch between expectations and delivery is high. So being able to demonstrate how your added value to the larger organization is the currency needed to continue operating. Data science teams add value in at least three ways. They can create a new data product, build organizational skills and capabilities, or expand awareness of technologies and capabilities that then lead other individuals and teams to take the next step themselves. Products can include data visualizations, predictions, recognition engines, speech recognition capabilities, image recognition, natural language processing, and all the different web application and Internet of Things methods for user interfaces and deployment. More abstractly, you're very often speeding up what was previously a human-driven process or enabling something to be done that that wasn't done before, largely because it was too costly to be done as a human driven process. Because of this, your products are often compared against human level accuracy as a first reaction, um, um, speech to, to, to text um, um, is a good example where this very often occurs. Um, and sometimes that, that can be a very, um, very hard, high bar to get to. Additionally, you rightly might get different reactions to outreach about potential projects from people based on how, these, how secure they feel in their current position and whether you're providing a new capability that they would have never had time to do themselves, automating 10% of the job that they just didn't really like anyways, or automating 75% of the job that makes up the bulk of the reason for them to be there. Again, this goes back to understanding how your projects fit into the larger organization. Today, there's a lot of centralization of data scientists and organizations. Part of the reason for this is the skills are in limited supply and the best ways to apply those skills are still being developed. However, as more and more staff know how to program and have machine learning experience, more activities under data science will happen throughout the organization and not on centralized teams. If you're on a centralized data science team, it is likely that part of your job, even if, even if not written down, is to speed up that transition. By expanding the number of people who know what is, isn't, or might be possible, and increasing the number of people wanting to use new technologies or brainstorming new applications. For example, sometimes this takes the form of singular meetings with people talk about the range of potential software solutions or open source co-libraries that might apply to the problem. By saving the team a week worth of understanding the, um, the landscape through large amounts of Google searches, you can increase the probability that they'll actually have enough time to make something useful. Just like awareness, building the capability of the larger organization is also part of a data science team. This includes both skills and IT infrastructure. 
Project partners and subject matter experts are often where this capability building happens informally. Data science projects are often completed and then handed over to another organization. Building that organization's staff's ability to maintain, understand, and use solutions is both often necessary for longer term success of the projects and it builds the capability of the larger organization in terms of skills and establishing the first use of new software and libraries, etc. So next I want to talk about procurement constraints. So in a large established organization, there are often policy and culture constraints around procurement, many of which directly or indirectly influence the ability of data scientists to effectively do their job. And so when we talk about procurement, what we're describing is kind of a collection of consideration around purchasing, around how you can spend money. And so one question to consider is if you're going to spend money and if you're going to invest um, time and energy in getting it through your organizational process, chances are that it's going to be a, at least a couple of years, maybe longer, before the next product can make it through this process again. So consider whether or not this product fits your organization now with the systems that are currently in place, but also moving into the future. What things are you onboarding? Um, and both in terms of the technology, but also in terms of the skill set of your workforce and what you want them to interact with. Um, in terms of the workflow, in terms of how people are working now, again, how you're in, trying to get your workforce to work in the future. Um, in terms, and this is all specifically with regards to their data. So if a large portion of your workforce is using Excel now, you expect that to continue for 10 years, consider that when you're thinking about buying something. Another question to ask is what is the process? Sometimes this isn't always well documented. Sometimes the variables you have to consider aren't well documented. So it's everything from understanding that you have to ask questions like, well, what is the licensing um, fee? Like, are you on a month by month? Is it on a concurrent user basis? Is it on a per desktop basis? I think all of these are questions to ask about not only what is the official process, but what kinds of purchases are allowed. So in some places, a monthly subscription fee that's below a certain limit is easier. In other places, a large lump sum for a license that will last you three years is easier to work with. And then there's the unofficial process, right? In a lot of organizations, there is the, this is the paperwork and these are all the hoops you have to jump through. And then the unofficial process is this is the person who owns that process who can maybe speed your meeting with this other stakeholder. And these things are written down, but questions to consider and to ask and maybe to dig into if you're sure that you want to um, move forward with the purchase of something. Another thing to consider is open source software versus proprietary software. There are benefits um, and um, cons to both. Open source can be really scary, um, and there are times when you do want to talk about risk. It's important to also um, consider that for people who sign off on things, for people who are kind of on paper accepting risk for a purchase, proprietary software from a big name is almost always going to be their preference. Um, Microsoft products, right, signing off on a Microsoft product might not cause someone harm to their career, but signing off on something that nobody knows about, that might actually have impact if something happens down the line, whether it's because of security, whether it's because of reliability. On the other hand, when you're trying to prototype and move really quickly and keep up with the latest technologies, implement things from people who are working in research labs, building on top of open source software can really speed your development cycle, speed your prototyping cycle, and get organizational buy-in faster. Um, another thing to think about is even though open source software is technically free, it still costs a lot of man hours to maintain it. And so for people who have organizations that can either give developer time or financial contributions to open source, it does help the sustainability of the community and the technology for everyone who uses it. Effective communication design at the start, middle, and end of a project is important for a variety of reasons that I'll get into over the next few slides. First, effective communication is important because data science is new, ill-defined, and someone's being magical. This is fun, but it also means there's high potential for a mismatch of expectations 
as this great XKCD comic demonstrates, and as I've mentioned on previous slides. Clients, partners, and managers aren't always going to have an understanding of why things are technically hard, easy, or doable. You have to tell them. They're also going to have different definitions in their heads for what does or doesn't fall into data science, both because data scientists driven teams haven't existed, or at least in the current form, very long, and also because what is possible is changing very quickly. For example, this comic was written only three years ago, and I bet there are people in this audience right now thinking of themselves, is bird recognition really a five-year-long problem? This situation is different than, say, an oil company's a team of uh, geologists working in exploration where relatively similar problems have been posed and relatively similar products been produced for many years. Because of this, expectations management needs to be a constant part of any project. When describing your work, the details of the mathematics, statistics, and algorithms are not always going to be understood in detail and are not always feasible to communicate. In order to correctly manage expectations, the emphasis is better put on business value business decision logic and range of uncertainty in terms of organizational resources required, time required, and range of possible prediction accuracy. Good general rule when presenting or explaining is you should be able to drop any of the math or programming or buzzwords and still ha have what you're saying make sense. At the beginning of projects, there's a significant need to define the problem, understand the data, how that data is accessed, how that project might be used in workflows, and how it fits into the larger data and decision space ecosystem in the organization. These are the questions that we found important to answer as early as possible. Bad assumptions at the start of a project can cause you to waste time working on dead ends, which then cause you to go back and repeat work. Being able to ask the right questions and get the right level of detail back is an important skill to develop that doesn't just happen automatically. A project that delivers a high accuracy prediction but is a pain to use is still a poor project. User-centered design is a range of techniques that can be used to better understand user problems and build effective, easy-to-use tools to meet those needs. I won't attempt to go into detail about it here except to say I would encourage anyone working on data science projects that will eventually be used by humans and not um, pass on to a second program to explore this philosophy and use it not just on user facing front end, but throughout the project design as well. My personal opinion on this is I think data visualization is undervalued. If machine learning success is easy to measure, as we can find in terms of accuracy, false negatives, etc., it is very difficult for us to look at data visualization and recognize how good or bad it is performing because our comprehension of it happens so fast, often faster than we're consciously thinking about. Therefore, we're more attracted to insights from machine learning, especially supervised learning, in a way that we aren't to data visualization. I think this is unfortunate because the number of problems that can be impacted by data visualization is probably larger than machine learning in any given organization, and we're probably missing opportunities. This could be its own talk, so we'll end with learn web development and JavaScript. JavaScript is where the really interesting data visualization is happening, and web development is the most effective way to share complex, high-dimensional information to a large number of people with minimal requirements on the user end. So now that Justin's off of his JavaScript soapbox, I'm going to talk about the distribution of data scientists in an organization. So what I mean by this is imagine a large organization who has had people doing computational work, has had people doing modeling, but hasn't really thought through a data science strategy or is just now trying to figure out like what does this data science thing mean to our organization. And so to um, introduce some of the concepts we're going to talk about, I want to note that we have the organization on one side and we have the data scientists on another. We want to ask, are there organizational fences between the data scientists and the people they are serving? And what the relationship um, between the two sides of data, of problems, of finished products, of training, and best practices are. 
And so one model for how data scientists are distributed throughout an organization is this idea of an innovation lab, where you have data scientists who have these best practices on one side, and then you have the rest of the organization as internal clients on the other. So the organization tosses data and problems over, and then at some point, the data scientists toss a product back out. And some of the great things about this organization structure is that you're able to concentrate the data scientists together so they can develop good best practices, they can sh um, share their learnings with each other. The con is that the knowledge stays on that side of the organizational fence and that you're not necessarily able to transfer as much knowledge to the rest of the organization. Now another model is the idea of embedded and rotations where you have data scientists kind of embedded within um, different teams and also kind of rotating throughout the organization. And so they take their training and their best practices and are now embedded within the client organizations. And some of the benefits is that they get to really deeply understand the context of the clients and partners they are working with. So not only what kind of data they have, but why was the data collected? Is there a way to collect it better? What are the actual business needs they're trying to ask? and answer, um, and the cons is that the data scientists can sometimes be isolated from each other and not necessarily have that much freedom of information and best practices flowing within the data science um, team. And then, so as they kind of do these projects, they send their learning and projects and best practices back to the data science team. Now another model is the centralized consultancy where you have data scientists on one end and you have the organization on the other and they kind of both contribute people to a project working group for a defined period of time. And this can look like a small prototype, this can look like a long-term operational project, or this can look like a one-time series of meetings. And so, um, and at, again, at some point someone's delivering a finished product. And so one thing that I wanted to touch on but won't go into detail about is that the effectiveness of a data science team also in some ways depends on your funding model for it. Are they only able to work on projects for clients who have the budget to spend so that they can bill their hours? Is your data science team a service that's free to your entire organization? Um, do data scientists have discretion to work on problems that they think are interesting and relevant where they're working in one part of the organization, but the things that they learn will be relevant to everyone else? These are all questions um, that will impact the way that data science knowledge and in some ways culture change around how people manage their data um, happens in your organization. The last thing I want to talk about with this section is how do you grow data science? The top-down approach is we need to have all of our data management in place. We need to have all of our data sources documented and all of our data owners documented. We need to have our, our appropriate role-based access so that people who need the right data can get to it before we can all do all this data science stuff. And the other idea is if you have, start from a grassroots approach, um, you have the data scientists going out, talking to lots of people, showing people this is what can happen, this is what's possible if you can um, leverage your data a little bit better. Um, and that's more on a culture change side. And I think both are needed, but I think it's important to consider kind of what is the overall strategy that your organization is taking. So finally, I want to say that data scientists, especially now in a large organization, need to be able to manage outward into many parts of an organization, need to be able to translate the math and the models into business speak, into what the actual um, value is. And I think that this is not a statement that will be true forever. I think that this is a statement that's true now as people figure out what to do with data scientists and data science, um, but that um, in the future as organizations develop their own models um, and document that for what it looks like to integrate data science into every part of an organization, um, that this statement will need to be revised. And so just to recap, all of these can make or break a project whether or not you can get data, whether or not you can communicate what kind of value data science has, the constraints and culture around buying things in your organization, um, the way you communicate um, and design the products that you create for your organization, um, the ways in which you structure the interaction of your data science team with everyone else in your organization. And I've seen this happen. I've seen projects that were really successful because all of these were in place. And then I've seen projects that had an interesting premise kind of just 
end up in email purgatory or somewhere else because one of these wasn't completely lined up. So with that, I want to thank you all for your time. And do we have time for questions? We can take one question while they're miking up here, so uh, the next speaker. Do you have a question? So I'll ask a quick question. So, so you did allude to it towards the end here. You see sort of organization maybe having to evolve over time into you know, as this mature field. So this really apply more, than, more, more broadly than just data science. It's actually any new technology to some degree you can apply this to, you know, in an organization because you, you need to. Uh, so where is NASA in that pipeline now in, in, in how they are treating data science? Yeah, I think a lot of it is about definitions right now. So there are people who have been doing scientific modeling for a long time. There are people who have been doing epidemiological models and like risk models. And so a lot of it is about bringing these communities together and saying like you're using the same techniques um, and solving a similar problem space with different applications. Um, and I think that's where we're trying to get really good at maybe in the next year or two. Okay. Join me in thanking our speaker again. And I think